Well, thank you very much uh, indeed to the, uh, the organisers for all your hard work in putting together this conference. And it's really a pleasure uh, to be here and to share my um, findings uh, with you. So uh, I begin with a slightly uh, speculative thought, which I'm happy for people to contradict, uh, which is that uh, if the 17th century, this era which witnessed, especially in Protestant Europe, uh, a great uh, uh, flourishing of Oriental studies, um, it was an age of uh, accumulation, the accumulation of uh, Oriental manuscripts. Uh, then the task facing the century that followed was to find ways of organizing that wealth of new material so that the knowledge contained in those manuscripts could be understood, uh, appreciated, uh, shared, and put to use uh, for scholarly ends. And I shall come on uh, to, to the case of Germany in a moment, but I want to begin with the example which I studied for my uh, first book, uh, the collections of Oriental manuscripts in England and specifically at the Bodleian Library in Oxford, founded in the early years of the 17th century. Uh, and in the course of 100 years or so, up until around uh, 1714, the library acquired some of its major uh, named collections, those of the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, and Chancellor uh, of the University, William Lord, uh, the scholar, uh, politician and patron of learning John Selden, the Church of uh, Ireland Archbishop Narcissus Marsh, whose collection included items purchased at autumn from uh, among the manuscripts of the great uh, Dutch scholar uh, Jacobus Grolius, as well as the personal collections of some of England's pioneer Orientalists, Edward Pocock, John Greaves, Robert Huntington uh, and Thomas Marshall. And the image you see here is from a collection of uh, engravings uh, published in uh, the 1680s to celebrate uh, the University of Oxford. And this one shows the Duke Humphreys reading room in the Bodleian Library. And maybe you can just about make out on the, the cornice along the top, it's written uh, uh, the, the manuscripts in Arabic, uh, uh, Coptic, uh, Syriac, Persian, and lots of other Oriental languages. And just below that, you can perhaps see in the middle panel, this is indicating that these manuscripts on the shelf are those of the, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, William Lord. So this shows you very much the, the sense that the university was very proud of these things and it was something which it would display in its uh, uh, promotional uh, material. Uh, and at the end of the 17th century, any visitor to Oxford uh, could find a list of some of those manuscripts in the general catalogue of British manuscripts seen uh, through the press by the Oxford scholar Edward Bernard in 1698. But he would not uh, have found there uh, very much more than a brief note uh, about the work's uh, author uh, and title. And indeed, it was not until the uh, 1760s, more than half a century later, that the Bodleian embarked in earnest on a specialized catalog of its Oriental manuscripts. And when Johannes Uri, the Hungarian scholar uh, commissioned to undertake this work, arrived in Oxford in uh, 1766, he wrote to his old tutor in Leiden that he found the manuscripts in a very disordered uh, and very confused state. Uh, his catalog appeared just over two decades later uh, in 16, uh, sorry, 1787. And yet it was not until the fourth decade of the 19th century, uh, 1833, that the second volume was completed, now 40 years after Uri's death by Alexander Nicol uh, and the High Churchman uh, and Orientalist Edward Bouvery Pusey. Uh, and indeed, any visitor to the new Oriental Reading Room in the Western Library, where the Bodleian's Oriental manuscripts are housed today, must still rely in large part on Uri's, uh, Nicol's and Pusey's efforts. So it's really a three-generational uh, process between this initial act of the acquisition of manuscripts and then the, the realization of the project uh, properly uh, to catalog them. Well, this process of collecting Oriental manuscripts in the German-speaking lands during the 17th century worked uh, slightly differently, in part because Germany was less integrated than England, uh, France, or the Netherlands into maritime uh, and long-distance trade networks, and in part because of the terrible disruptions to social and cultural life occasioned uh, by the Thirty Years' War. <clears throat> Some early collections, like those <clears throat> in England, had been pieced together by travelers, such as Adam Oliarius and Christian Ravius, both of whose libraries eventually uh, came here uh, to Berlin. A significant difference 
uh, as Paul Babitsky has shown, was the large number of Turkenbeuter, manuscripts looted uh, from conquered Ottoman cities or stripped from corpses on the battlefield, uh, which came into German collections increasingly in the wake of the failed Ottoman siege of Vienna, uh, 1683, and the Habsburg conquests of Neuhausel, uh, 1685, Buda, 1686, uh, and Belgrade, 1688. And indeed, in the, some of the collections on uh, the presentations on uh, Wednesday about the libraries in Karlsruhe and uh, other places, we heard already uh, something about these uh, Turkenbeuter collections, which are quite specific, I think, to or, or mark a difference between the collections you would find in uh, Germany as a consequence of this movement of manuscripts during the early modern period and those which you would find uh, in, in England, where they were assembled uh, in a rather different way. But a similar dynamic of acquisition, uh, followed by the need to organize and interpret, was also at play. As Babinski has also pointed out, this posed an acute challenge. One particular consequence of the largely Ottoman provenance of many Oriental manuscripts in German collections meant that they often combined material in the three languages uh, of Arabic, Turkish, and Persian. But the last two in particular were typically beyond uh, the competences of most German scholars who had acquired any knowledge of Oriental languages they possessed within the early modern tradition of the Studio Orientalia with its roots in biblical philology. Uh, and this leads me to the subject of my uh, talk here. Uh, John Paul Gobriel has argued recently in a thought-provoking article that the challenge which I've just described was often solved by traveling Eastern Christians, although often working behind the scenes, as it were, and therefore leaving little trace in modern histories of Western Orientalism. Eastern Christians worked not only as language teachers, uh, but also as translators, catalogers, or authenticators of manuscripts. And indeed, Gobriel argues that a better understanding of what he calls the social history of manuscript collections, the unseen work that went into copying, cataloging, and interpreting early modern archives could even serve to transform our understanding of uh, European Orientalism. Uh, well, the man with whom I propose to, propose to test this thesis uh, has left some trace uh, in modern historiography. He's probably familiar to uh, some of you, and yet uh, an early, uh, 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 a legacy of early 20th century scholarship uh, has left a rather distorted or rather confused picture of the man uh, best known by the name Carolus Rali Didici. The Halle librarian uh, Wolfram Zutia's rather oddly titled book points to its even uh, odder conclusion. Carolus Rali Didici oder wie sich deutsche Orientalisten von einem Schwindler dupieren ließen. How uh, German Orientalists allowed themselves to be duped uh, by a swindler. Uh, Zutia, following a short account of Didici's years uh, in Germany between 17 uh, 17 and 1719, argued that he was not, uh, as he claimed to be, a Syrian, but ein Schwindler, who fooled a whole series of German scholars into believing uh, his bona fide credentials as an Oriental by dazzling them with his phenomenal uh, linguistic skills. Even worse than that, the real Didici was, uh, in truth, Suchu thought, a Frenchman. Well, that the thesis uh, set out in Suchu's book is not, uh, to my mind, particularly convincing, even on its own terms, and it seems even less compelling now in the light of further pieces of evidence uh, turned up by Wolfgang Hager and Dmitry Morozov and Ekaterina Gerasimova in Marburg uh, and in Moscow. And so I'm just going to give you uh, a very brief uh, summary of um, Didici's life. He was born in uh, Aleppo in um, uh, Syria, either in 1693 or 1694 into a Christian family where he was very likely educated by Catholic and probably by uh, Jesuit uh, missionaries. In 1707, when Didici was just 13 or 14, he was selected as part of a scheme initiated by the French uh, Minister for the Navy, the Comte de Pontchartrain, as one of two youths to be brought to Paris and educated there at the Collège Louis Le Grand uh, by the Jesuits. After seven and a half years uh, study in France, he set out on his return uh, to Syria, but forced by a storm to dock at uh, Sorry, Livorno. Uh, Livorno, he uh, headed south uh, to Rome where he remained uh, for 18 months. And it was in Rome, I think, that he probably first uh, encountered one of the major uh, European uh, collections of um, Oriental manuscripts. He apparently found his way there into the circle of the Cardinal, uh, Annibale Albani, uh, a nephew of Pope Clement XI, uh, and probably through him got to know the Vatican librarian and Syriac scholar uh, Giuseppe Simone Assamani. Well, it was not long before uh, Didici 
set off uh, again. He traveled north through Italy to Ancona, uh, Bologna, um, uh, Modena, uh, Parma, uh, and Milan. Uh, and he then passed into Switzerland, arriving uh, in uh, 17, 1716 uh, in Geneva. Uh, and it's at this point that uh, Didici's career changed course uh, decisively. In a later account, uh, he tells us in just a few words, um, with nothing by way of context or explanation, that he makes in Geneva a profession of the Reformed faith. And, and from this point onwards, his life is spent uh, largely in the service of Protestant European uh, theologians. So Didici now embarks on a, a journey through uh, the Reformed and into the Lutheran uh, German-speaking world. He goes east uh, as far as uh, Leipzig, uh, and then he ends, uh, eventually moves to London, where he uh, uh, dies in the year uh, 1734. Well, in the time that remains, I want to suggest uh, three ways in which Didici served uh, this community of Protestant scholars and collectors among uh, whom he worked and whom he encountered uh, in the German-speaking lands as an interpreter uh, of some of the uh, German Oriental manuscripts. And I'm going to talk briefly about his time in uh, Frankfurt, uh, in Strasbourg, and um, in, uh, in Halle. Uh, and the first role in which we see him uh, engaging in this capacity is as that, uh, or in that uh, of a cataloger. Now, I suggested a moment ago that uh, Didici might have been exposed to this kind of work in, in Catholic Rome, but it was in the very different context of Frankfurt in 1719 uh, that Didici first appears to have undertaken uh, this kind of work for himself. There, uh, he was introduced to the collector, uh, Zacharias Conrad von Uffenbach, about whom uh, we heard uh, something uh, in the presentation on the, the library in, um, uh, in Hamburg. Uh, and Uffenbach's collection is quite well known. Indeed, uh, there's a very fine uh, uh, recent book about it, so I won't go into too many details. But suffice to say that among the ten rooms full of books with which he'd filled his house by 1719 was a small collection uh, of Arabic and Turkish manuscripts. Uh, most of these appear uh, to have been Turkenbeuter. Among Offenbach's collection were many Qurans, uh, and tellingly, I think, uh, fragmentary copies of selected surahs, often accompanied with uh, prayers in Arabic uh, and Turkish. And also among the collection were books on Islamic law, or fiqh, uh, grammar, oratory, ethics, astrology and divination, amulets, a copy of Avicenna on simples, uh, some miscellaneous Turkish mercantile correspondence and account books, and a history of the patriarchs of Alexandria, translated into Arabic uh, from the Coptic. And in 1719, uh, Uffenbach was engaged in preparing a catalogue of his manuscripts, assisted by the professor of Oriental languages at Gießen, uh, Johann Heinrich May. Uh, to May had been delegated the task of cataloguing the Greek and Oriental manuscripts, but May was unable to read the books in Arabic and Turkish. The section of the catalogue uh, listing just over 30 works in these languages was therefore compiled from notes added to the manuscripts by uh, Didici. And here you can see the, the, the title page of um, the, the catalog of Uffenbach's manuscripts published in 1720. Uh, and on the other side of the slide, the, the, the first page of the list of Oriental manuscripts. And you can probably uh, make out that uh, Carolus Didici is credited in the, uh, the, the, the heading there. Well, what can we learn from uh, these notes and, uh, and, and, and from the catalog? Well, well, firstly, it's quite striking to see, particularly uh, as a consequence of their ignorance of Turkish, uh, how much faith Uffenbach and May were inclined to place in Didici's identifications. In the note for one item, number 22 in the catalogue, we learn that Uffenbach had bought at auction what was described in the catalogue as a history of the prophets, particularly of Muhammad and his family, written uh, in Persian. Uh, Didici, however, had confirmed that it was in fact written in Turkish, and thus it was recorded as such in the catalogue, Uffenbach adding to the relevant entry that he trusted Didici's judgment above anyone else's. It's worth noting, uh, though, that even by the standards of the time, the entries based on Didici's notes are fairly rudimentary. Uh, there's typically some comment about the script, whether it's difficult to read or more elegantly written, uh, and whether it is vocalized, i.e. written with the diacritical uh, marks indicating uh, short vowels in Arabic uh, or not. The absence of any historically or culturally specific vocabulary uh, to describe the different forms of Arabic, Turkish, and Persian script, uh, Didici tended to distinguish between hands he described as simplici ac rotundo, plain and round, uh, and divanico vel forensi, uh, of the divan or 
uh, what we might uh, translate as secretarial uh, and public. Uh, beyond these details about the appearance of the manuscripts, the entries typically contain the name of the author or copyist, uh, sometimes the date of copying, uh, and a brief description of the contents, in most cases uh, limited to a single statement of the topic, a book of eloquence, a book of Muslim prayers, uh, and so forth. And there's no attempt really to give uh, Arabic or Turkish titles or to transliterate Arabic terms. Fiqh, for example, uh, always appears as Librum Juridico Theologicum, uh, etc. This, by the way, is, so this is the catalogue, and this is um, one of the, the, the manuscripts, the, um, the, the, the history of the Alexandrian patriarchs, which I mentioned. And, and you can see uh, on the, the slide on the, on the left at the top, uh, I think is probably Uffenbach's own note of his uh, acquisition. He bought this particular manuscript from a, uh, an auction uh, of, of a European collector, so it was already in a European collection when Uffenbach acquired it. And on the slide on the right, underneath the, the colophon of the, the manuscript, you can see uh, Didici's um, handwritten notes in, in Latin. So he actually writes his notes into the manuscript, and then uh, a summary of these notes gets uh, incorporated into the, into the catalogue. This is now in... Um, uh, in um, Hamburg, because uh, when Uffenbach's uh, collection was sold, as we heard in the, the presentation on the, the, the library, it's, uh, it was bought by Johann Christian Wolf, uh, and so most of the, uh, the, the Arabic manuscripts which, um, which Uffenbach uh, owned uh, moved from uh, Frankfurt to, um, to Hamburg. Uh, uh, nonetheless, the fact that uh, Uffenbach and May credited uh, Didici's work in the printed uh, catalogue is some indication of their appreciation of his labours uh, and the nondescript and rather uh, sorry entry uh, for the last, uh, 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 the penultimate item in the catalogue uh, brings home, I think, just how dependent they were on his enterprise. So there we read volume 53, Octavo, a most elegant Arabic manuscript, which arrived after Carolus de Dici had left. Um, okay, uh, well, the second role uh, in which we find uh, de Dici uh, working is more specifically as an interpreter of these manuscripts, particularly in pedagogical uh, context. And here I turn uh, briefly to uh, Didici's work in Gorta uh, and in Halle with the, the pietist uh, theologian and founder of a, a missionary institute whom uh, uh, Daniel Haas uh, talked about on Wednesday, Johann Heinrich Kallenberg. Uh, in Gorta and in Halle, uh, Didici and Kallenberg had at their disposal a small and eclectic selection of oriental manuscripts, a large part of which, like Uffenbach's library, had probably originated uh, in collections of Turkenbeuter. Uh, in the Ducal Library in Gorta, they found a manuscript copy of the Khenaza Talfiq, the Treasury of Islamic Law, a handbook of Hanafi jurisprudence uh, produced by the 10th century author Abu Layth Samarkandi. Uh, this manuscript had been acquired in the 1640s by the Oriental scholar uh, Johann Ernst Gerhard. And both from Kallenberg's descriptions of their collaboration and from his extant notes, it's possible uh, to reconstruct the way that he and Didici worked uh, through the text word by word. So this is not obviously the, the, the original manuscript, but this is um, uh, Kallenberg's notes now in Halle. And you can see on the, the right uh, a running list of vocabularies. They work together uh, through the manuscript, uh, which enables eventually Kallenberg to produce his own uh, translation from Arabic into Latin. And that's the, 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 the slide that you see in the center, uh, Kallenberg's uh, translation. Uh, so Kallenberg and Didici ventured to Gorta together in September 17. Uh, 18. And by this time, there was already something of an established, sorry, ventured to Halle together uh, in 1718. And by this time, uh, there was already something of an established tradition of Arabic pedagogy at the orphanage uh, school in Halle. This had been established uh, in the early years of the 18th century by another Syrian, uh, Solomon Negri, a figure whose career is more familiar to us thanks to some fine recent work by John Paul Gabriel uh, and Paula Manstetten. Uh, as part of their Arabic studies, students were recommended uh, to progress from the handful of Arabic books uh, printed in 17th century Europe to manuscripts, first the Quran uh, and then uh, the Tafsir, uh, Quranic commentators. And Didici very much uh, continued in this tradition. After a year teaching Arabic to around 14 theological students in Halle, uh, Didici proposed to supplement his lessons with an hour a day, guiding his charges through Arabic texts in manuscript. For this, uh, he would have used the small uh, collection uh, in the, uh, the, the, the orphanage uh, library uh, mostly Qurans, uh, Tafsir, uh, and Fiqh. And here's one of those manuscripts. And I've chosen this one. I don't know for certain that uh, Didici used this as a, as a teaching aid, but it's quite likely because it was acquired by the library in 1717, just a year before he uh, arrived there. And this is, a, uh, again, a, a fragmentary um, 
uh, compilation of uh, Quranic stories accompanied by prayers in Arabic and Turkish and other short historical um, data. And it has this rather nice uh, note in the, the first page in, um, uh, of the manuscript explaining that it was um, uh, acquired as uh, Turkenbeuter uh, um, in, uh, in uh, 17, six, uh, 1716 and brought to the, uh, to the library um, uh, in the following year. This, I should say, is all very helpfully set out in uh, Arika Pab's uh, uh, catalogue of the of the of the, of the, uh, the manuscripts, the Oriental manuscripts in Halle. Well, the third and final role in which we find Didici is as a producer uh, of Oriental manuscripts, and here it's worth reflecting, I think, on what we mean by Oriental manuscripts in Western collections. Do we include under that heading those manuscripts produced in the West by travelling scholars uh, like um, Didici? And I'll just give one example of a manuscript which I've not yet been able to track down, but which we know uh, from a description of it by the later 18th century uh, Swedish uh, Orientalist, Jacob Jonas Bjornstahl, who's been mentioned uh, already. Uh, in Strasbourg, uh, as a pedagogical aid for Johann Heinrich Ledelin, uh, did she produce a Latin translation of the Quran? And as Bjornstahl recorded in the, the passage I've highlighted here, this contained uh, the Latin text across half of the page, and on the other half, the Arabic words with notes uh, indicating their roots. So Didici, I suggest, did not just interpret uh, European collections of Oriental manuscripts then, but in this uh, particular way uh, added to them. This manuscript, as the uh, Bjornstahl notes, was passed at Ladelin's death to his son-in-law, uh, Johann Heinrich Scherer, uh, also professor of Oriental languages at, uh, in Strasbourg, uh, who evidently prized it uh, as something uh, of a rarity. So, a few thoughts then uh, in conclusion. Uh, on one level, uh, Didici certainly proves the point uh, made by uh, Jean-Paul Gabriel. Uh, in Strasbourg, in Frankfurt, in Gorta, uh, and in Halle, as well as in the other stops on his journey through G Germany, uh, Didici evidently helped European scholars and collectors to make sense of the Oriental manuscripts in their collections as a cataloger, a reader, and uh, as I've suggested, a, a producer of uh, of manuscripts. But I would be slightly cautious about overemphasizing his contribution and, in particular, uh, of making any uh, exaggerated claims about his expertise. Uh, we've seen already that the notes he provided uh, on Uffenbach's manuscripts were fairly rudimentary. They don't seem to me uh, to contain specialist knowledge, obviously surpassing that of the German scholars who were beginning to undertake similar work uh, around the same time. Sebastian Gottfried Starke, who prepared a catalogue of the Oriental manuscripts in Berlin, uh, and Jörg Jacob Kerr, who catalogued the Leipzig manuscripts in 1723, although we should note that Kerr uh, had benefited from Didici's teaching uh, at Halle uh, a few years previously. Among the list of vocabulary compiled by Kallenberg and Didici as they worked through uh, Samarkandi in Gotha, uh, entries for Sabil, Avia, Sora, Forma, Salt, Vox. In other words, it was hardly very advanced stuff. Uh, and certainly nothing which Kallenberg could not have learned from a work produced in Europe more than half a century earlier, uh, Jacobus Golius's uh, Latin Arabic lexicon, uh, which had exploited the most important works in the Arabic, Persian, and Turkish lexicographical uh, traditions. Didici's Quran translation, as uh, Bjornstahl says in the, the second part of this uh, quotation, uh, was derived, according to him, uh, from the work of the 17th century Catholic scholar uh, Ludovico uh, Maracci. There's perhaps some parallel here uh, with a case a century or so earlier of the European study of Hebrew. Although early medieval and Renaissance pioneers depended on Jewish collaborators, by the 17th century, at least for basic instruction in the language, uh, Europeans had largely surpassed any need uh, for their Jewish teachers. In a similar way, in the age of accumulation uh, during the 17th century, European scholars of Arabic uh, relied extensively on Ottoman and other native speakers of Arabic, Persian, uh, and Turkish to acquire and to interpret manuscripts uh, for them. Uh, and by contrast, I think that by the time Didici traveled through uh, Germany, uh, this collaborative work had already spawned uh, a largely autonomous uh, scholarly culture, which enabled and facilitated both the work of Western and of Eastern readers uh, of Oriental manuscripts. Uh, and there I finish, and thank you very much for your uh, attention.